Jennifer Pulley and welcome to another edition of NASA 360. Today we've got so many things lined up for you. We're going to talk about technology, we're going to talk about exploration, and we're going to talk about dinosaurs and how they're all related. But first, let's talk about where I'm standing. Get this, I'm standing inside a fort. That's right, and it's not just any fort. This is Jamestown Fort. It's the site of the first permanent English colony in what was then called the New World. Today, of course, we know it as America. Now think about this. From this starting point, people spread out all across the country and eventually populated the entire United States. So I guess we have to say that this landing spot is a pretty big deal in American history. Over time, though, the original fort that the English settlers built fell into disrepair. And believe it or not, for many years, it was lost to history. That all changed in 1996 when archaeologist Dr. Bill Kelso rediscovered the original fort. It began a whole new era of understanding what life was like for those first Jamestown settlers. For the first time, they had proof. Using old writings, drawings, and now a handy trowel for digging, Dr. Kelso and his team discovered where the old fort was, and they began excavating the artifacts. To date, he and his team have found over one million artifacts from the original fort, and they expect to find many more in the next few years. In a little while, we'll catch up with Dr. Kelso and dig a little deeper into the history of Jamestown. But first, do you know the difference between an archaeologist and a paleontologist? Well, let's see. They both dig in the ground looking for things from the past, right? Well, it's the type of things they're looking for that make them different. You see, archaeology is the science of understanding human cultures, while paleontology is the study of prehistoric life forms. So basically, then archaeologists spend their time trying to understand human history, while paleontologists generally look for fossils from before human history, like dinosaur bones. <laughs> Got it? Luckily for archaeologists and paleontologists, tons of help is now coming from NASA. How? Well, one of the ways is through the use of remote sensing techniques. Remote sensing? Well, in the broadest sense, it's the use of a device to collect information without actually physically touching the object. Now, a great example of a remote sensing device we use every single day are eyes. Think about it. You can detect objects around you without physically touching them. You simply use your detectors, or your eyes, to see the object gather information about it, you're using remote sensing. There are many forms of NASA-sponsored remote sensing devices that are being used to help in archaeology and paleontology. Like, for example, there's something called ground-penetrating radar. This unique type of radar system can actually see objects in the ground without anyone having to dig them up. By using this, in combination with aerial photography and historical documents, NASA can help give researchers a much better indication of where to dig, what to preserve, and what areas to avoid. Satellites are another type of remote sensing tool being used by NASA researchers to help archaeologists and paleontologists. In fact, NASA archaeologist Dr. Tom Seaver has been using satellite data to help us understand why the Mayan civilization in Guatemala collapsed and how current populations may be able to prevent future disaster. Let me try to break it down for you. Between the 3rd and 9th century, the Mayan civilization in Central America flourished. But after about the 9th century, they collapsed, leaving archaeologists few clues as to why this once mighty civilization disappeared. This is where NASA comes in. Our remote sensing satellites can detect even small changes within the electromagnetic spectrum. So sand, cultivated soil, vegetation, and rocks each have distinctive spectral signatures, which are easily distinguished from each other. So archaeologists can use info from the remote sensing satellites to quickly target specific areas of interest, then send teams to that area to validate the findings. Dr. Seaver and his team have already found several previously undiscovered sites and feel confident that they know where others are, thanks to NASA's remote sensing satellites. That is how NASA is helping researchers find old ruins. But remote sensing satellites are also helping us understand why the Mayan civilization may have disappeared. Today, the Patan rainforest in Guatemala is covered with trees and is not heavily populated. But it was not like this during the peak of the Mayan civilization. In fact, during that time, this region had a population of about 2,000 people per square mile, 
which is about the same as current day Los Angeles. With a population that large, the Mayas had to farm huge areas of land. To do this, they employed a technique called slash and burn, which eventually destroyed virtually every tree for hundreds of miles. Computer models show that as the trees disappeared, so did the rain, which caused temperatures to increase by five to six degrees. All of these shifts may have caused malnutrition and disease, which in turn contributed to its collapse. This information is especially important for us today because slash and burn techniques are once again being used in the areas that were once Mayan strongholds. Understanding what happened to the Mayas may dissuade current generations of farmers from following the same destructive path. So, as you can see, NASA technology is being used for a lot more than just to help us in space. It's being used to help save lives back here on Earth, too. Hey, in a little bit, we'll swing back out here to Jamestown to talk with Dr. Kelso. But first, let's head to North Dakota. Johnny Alonzo's there to see what a mummified dinosaur and NASA have in common. Hang on tight, you're watching NASA 360. Hey, how's it going? Let me ask you something. Have you ever seen a real dinosaur? And I'm not talking about one of those dinosaurs you might see in the movies or even the skeletons in the museums. I'm talking about a real dinosaur with skin, muscle, and bones. Yeah, it might be hard nowadays considering the fact that dinosaurs lived, what, hundreds of millions of years ago. But what if I told you that researchers found a dinosaur just like that? Would you believe it? Well, if you said no, you better start believing. Because a few years ago, researchers found an actual mummified dinosaur that was still intact from the skin, the cartilage, to muscle. A mummified hadrosaur named Dakota is so unique in its discovery that it's changing what researchers thought they knew about dinosaurs. I rolled out to Bismarck, North Dakota to speak with my buddy, Dr. John Hoganson, about this amazing discovery and to find out how NASA is helping unearth more clues. All right. Oh, wow, are you kidding me? Yeah, this is the. Uh, <laughs> this is so cool. This is the tail section of the Ow. duckbill dinosaur called Dakota, and it's being prepared here at the North Dakota Geological Survey Preparation Laboratory here at the Heritage Center in Bismarck. This is something else. Wow. So, Doc, um, how was this dinosaur found? Well, this uh, fossil was found in 1999 by Tyler Leeson down in Marmoth, North Dakota, which is in the southwest corner of the state. Um, he was only a sophomore in high school at the time, but was out exploring for fossils, actually, on his uncle's property down in the Badlands. Now, this is uh, a hadrosaur called uh, Edmontosaurus. That's a scientific name for this particular species of dinosaur. Uh -huh. uh, hadrosaurs were duck-billed dinosaurs. They, uh, they were a group of dinosaurs that uh, were referred to as duck-billed dinosaurs because their snouts were compressed. Uh, and it's very similar to a modern duck. So what is so unique about this fossil? Well, you know, generally paleontologists, when we're out exploring for fossils, will only find individual bones or fragments of uh, jaws or things like that. Okay. This particular uh, dinosaur called Dakota is uh, not only a complete skeleton, but it's very unique because uh, the skin is uh, actually preserved on this animal. So the entire skeleton appears to be wrapped in, uh, in the skin that it was enclosed in. This is called a mummified dinosaur, but it's not a mummy in the sense of uh, what we generally think about like an Egyptian mummy that has been embalmed by, for preservation. The skin on this uh, animal is actually preserved because it's been replaced by a mineral uh, called siderite, which is an iron carbonate kind of mineral which is uh, very hard and, and has preserved the skin. All right, so how did NASA get involved with this dinosaur discovery? Well. Researchers needed a way to scan through all the layers of rock to see all the dinosaur. And since this thing weighs about 10 tons, they needed a really, really big scanner. Well, you know, when we usually find these fossils in the field, we generally just find the bones, the skeletons. And uh, it was determined early on during the excavation process that this particular dinosaur was covered in skin. So it was uh, decided to take these uh, uh, skeleton blocks out uh, still entombed in the rock, so big blocks of rocks were removed. And 
At that point, it was decided that the best technology to use to determine the position of the bones in the rock and the completeness of the skeleton was to uh, use CAT scan technologies, and that's where NASA was, uh, was asked if they could help with this. And, and it's been a, a very good, good approach because with this tail block that we're working on right now, we, through the CAT scan technology, are able to know where the bones are before we actually start digging through, uh, through the rock matrix. Luckily for these guys, NASA operates the largest CT scanner in the world. Located at a Boeing facility in Canoga Park, California, this scanner's first priority is to inspect large space shuttle parts. Well, the task for Dakota was not all that different. So they loaded Dakota on a truck and shipped it off to California. When it arrived, the scanner was able to penetrate the dense iron carbonate that surrounded the dinosaur's tail section. And right away, researchers saw bones, tissue, and cartilage. Well, since I've been a paleontologist, which has been a few years, there's been a lot of technological changes and advancements that have really helped the science. Uh, in addition to the CAT scan, uh, technology that we've been talking about here. Uh, there's a lot of remote sensing type of uh, technologies that are available to us now. Uh, global position systems uh, uh, mapping, uh, LIDAR kinds of uh, uh, laser mapping, uh, various uh, other kinds of technologies that assist us in the field actually locating and uh, positioning the fossil finds because it's very important to us to know where in the in the uh, rock column the fossil is found and also of course the geographic position of the fossil. Okay. We also use uh, you know, CAT scans for determining uh, the bone structures of skulls and also the size of uh, brain cases in, huh. in uh, skulls, uh, fossil skulls that have been found. So uh, technology is used uh, extensively now in uh, paleontology. We're preparing uh, this for exhibit. The tail and one of the arms will be prepared and put on exhibit here at the North Dakota Heritage Center, which is yes. open to the public. So, yes. so uh, we plan to have it here for quite some time if people are interested in coming and seeing it. Good, absolutely. Well, Doctor, thank you so much for having us sure. here at the North Dakota yeah, Heritage Center. Really good to have you here. Most definitely. Thank you. Hey, in a little bit, I'm going to tell you how NASA's bringing history to life on the Lewis and Clark Trail. So don't go anywhere. It's coming right up. You're watching NASA 360. Okay, so the first English settlers landed here in Jamestown in 1607, but the first years, oh, they were rough. In fact, for many years, there was question as to whether this small fort would actually survive. There was starvation and a lot of sickness. But thanks to some local Indians and some resupply from England, this small little fort held on and it began to flourish. In fact, from 1612 to 1698, Jamestown was the capital of the whole country. Eh, that changed when a fire swept through the state house and it forced the capital to be moved to Williamsburg. Just a few years later, Jamestown was gone, both physically and in memory. Over the centuries, people believed that the old fort and all of its artifacts had actually washed away into the James River. But that all changed in 1994, when the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, or for short, the APVA, commissioned an archaeological dig in the area where the original fort was thought to be. Why? Well, APVA lead archaeologist Dr. Bill Kelso believed the original fort had not been washed away at all. He had a hunch that he knew where to find the fort, and uh, this old church had something to do with it. The reason that I started digging where I did was that the church, there's a church tower here that's the only original above ground part of Jamestown, 17th century, and the church was originally uh, in the midst of the fort. It was right. one, of the, one of the records said this, you know, so it, well, it ought to be around here somewhere, so starting near the church was the, was the key, and it was an area that had never really been looked at before, ironically enough. It's high ground, it's really made sense now that we know where the fort is. Can you walk me through the, kind of the excavation process, the recording, we were talking a little bit mm -hmm. about the technology, and then where do the artifacts go from there? Well, artifacts are removed from their soil, and once we understand the context, we call it, where they're found, they're taken to a lab 
uh, and, and they're washed, and then some of these, like these iron objects, would have to be conserved. Some things, probably one or two percent of what we have here, will go on exhibit. We have a, you know, a museum here, and there are other traveling exhibits and other things that we do, just to uh, to tell the Jamestown story. It's all metal down to here. That's, that's why it's locked together. together. That's Lord Delaware's. That comes over to Lord Delaware. <laughs> Dr. Kelso, how long have you been an archaeologist? Well, I started probably uh, 1607, something like that. <laughs> wow, you look great. Uh, thank you very much. Wait, over 400 40. years old. Gosh. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been a while, uh, 45 years, I guess I would say. Yeah. All right, so in that time, in those 45 years, tell me what have you seen, what changes have you seen, technology, technological advances? Well, the, the, ma uh, the major technological advance, you would think that we would have invented x ray vision, you know, and we'd save a lot of digging. Right. But that hasn't happened. There are certain machines that can give you some reading below ground without digging, remote sensing. But um, what I think the breakthrough has been has been in recording the, re the record of archaeology because archaeology I think in the past is something that's viewed as destructive but now we have the technology through a GIS program um, uh, that uh, we can record almost in three dimensions and we're close and if you can record in three dimensions then you can actually replicate the site again digitally and you know re and relook at it that still doesn't replace uh, just you know blood sweat and tears I mean it's just down it's digging it's stooping it's um, uh, using uh, our main instrument here is just this small shovel and you know it takes a long time to dig out a hole like this with something like this and uh, but we have to do that so that we don't disturb artifacts so tell me about some of the amazing things you found well we've found over a million artifacts in this project but there are certain things that really do stand out. One of those things that stands out is a lead luggage tag with its destination stamped on it, Jamestown. This tag made the long journey from England to the New World on a wooden ship, then was discarded into the bottom of a well. After its rediscovery, 400 years later, it would again be making a long trip, this time into space. To help celebrate the 400th anniversary of Jamestown, this lowly luggage tag was placed aboard the space shuttle Atlantis, where it traveled nearly six million miles around the Earth. After the space flight was over, the tag was returned to Jamestown, where it went back on display in the Jamestown Archaearium with other artifacts from the old fort. I think it really highlights the, uh, the, uh, the sort of age-old exploration process uh, that in 1607, you had to get the vehicles, you had to raise the money, you had to get the political things in order, the charter to come to Virginia uh, and, and dress appropriately with armor and closed helmets and because it was an alien environment you had to put, the, put some kind of a, a, it's almost like a, it is almost like a space station you know, here in, uh, or an outpost you know, to begin to explore an unknown unknown environment in Virginia and that's and NASA's yeah. continuing to do that right and here's the colonization of the moon and what, what are the problems well you got to get there you got to you got to have the right vehicles what do you take with you you know how do you survive in this alien environment you put an artificial surface around you, you know, and, and you dress appropriately so but it is it, it's really an age-old thing this whole psychological need to explore um, a spiritual need to explore I think is, is, is still today just as it was in, in, uh, at the time of Jamestown. All right so let's talk a little bit about this correlation between the early explorers yourself your explorer and then the future explorers. Well I'm kind of an explorer of explorers <laughs> there is explorers I mean they well, we're trying to figure out what it was like to, to explore and to discover, and we, our project's called Jamestown Rediscovery. You know, we're not discovering Jamestown, we're rediscovering it. And a good example is this space here. That uh, here, This was used as a laboratory to study the minerals and, and uh, uh, the, the iron ore of this new land, to see if, if, there, if it could be profitable right. to come here. You know? right. So I think that's very similar to what I've read about. Uh, explorations, uh, especially on Mars, they send out vehicles and they do drilling and they, they look at the materials. And that's, that's what was going on here. And so this space was where, uh, I'm sure the people you've heard of before, John, Captain John Smith walked around here. You know, uh, maybe Pocahontas checking out the blacksmith shop. That is so cool. That's, I mean, that's ama what an amazing job you have. Well, this, that, that's what, that's the payoff, is, is to, 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 to 
feel the place, to walk the places, to be in the places that where these historical events happened. So then the events take on such much more meaning than if you just read them in the textbooks. Earlier, Dr. Kelso mentioned the similarities between the 1607 Jamestown Explorers and NASA's future space explorers. What about all the explorers in between? Guys like Daniel Boone, Neil Armstrong come to mind, as well as many countless others who have helped broaden our knowledge through exploration. Perhaps two of the most famous names in American exploration history are Lewis and Clark. You ever heard of them? They blazed a trail through the American West, mapping out their path as they went. So what do you think? Did NASA have anything to do with the Lewis and Clark expedition? Well, not the original trip, but NASA is helping out now. Johnny Alonzo will tell you all about it. All right, so we've seen a lot today how NASA's helping archaeologists and paleontologists through remote sensing. These remote sensing devices have helped us unearth some really cool findings in places like Cambodia, Central America, and the American Southwest. And they've also helped along one of the most famous trails in American history, the Lewis and Clark Trail. To find out how NASA helped map this 200-year-old trail, I rolled up to Fort Manda in North Dakota, to where Lewis and Clark spent their first winter. Before we get into NASA's involvement, let's go back a few hundred years at the beginning of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Back in 1804 when the expedition began, we knew almost nothing about what was to the west of St. Louis. So President Thomas Jefferson commissioned Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to lead an expedition west to find the first all-water route to the Pacific Ocean. This was an epic journey, taking several years and 3,700 miles to complete. During this trip, they collected samples of plants and animals, met many of the different Indian tribes of the west, and brought back detailed data about the route that they had taken. But even though they brought back some pretty good maps and data, they still weren't 100% accurate. That's because most of these journals weren't written right away, or they were written after a hard day's travel. And many of the entries contained geographical inaccuracies. So, this is where NASA comes in. Researchers from NASA Stennis Space Center took the maps of Lewis and Clark and combined them with high-resolution images taken from satellites and aircraft. They created maps with a 360-degree view of an area where the explorers traveled. From that view, archaeologists could follow the trails as if they were flying over the actual landscape in real time and in any direction or angle they chose. Researchers pored over these maps looking for telltale signs of human disturbances unique to the Lewis and Clark expedition. With this technique, archaeologists were able to narrow down some of the possible sites from many miles to a few acres. This information is helping to find Lewis and Clark artifacts that provide a clearer understanding of the expedition and what the lives of those early explorers had been like. And don't forget, NASA has a new generation of explorers too, that'll soon be going back to the moon and on to Mars. So in the future, when we talk about great explorers, there's no doubt that NASA's astronauts will be on the list. It's amazing, isn't it? Just when you thought you knew everything about NASA, we throw something else at you. So as you can see, NASA is not only trying to help shape our future, it's also making the past clearer. That's it for this episode. For Jennifer Pulley, I'm Johnny Alonzo. I'll catch you next time on NASA 360. By dinosaur. Sorry, it was still in. <laughs> These remote sensing devices have helped us on. Two. Why? Well, APVA lead archaeologist. Dr. Bill Kelso believed he thought. To find out how NASA helped. Two. That's right, a mummified hadrosaur named Dakota. Let's head out to North Dakota. Johnny Alonzo is learning how NASA technology was used to unearth some really cool, you, really unique guys like Daniel Boone and Neil Armstrong may come to mind as well as many countless uh, <laughs> Dr. Bellalala. I rolled out to Fort Mandan, North Dakota. Damn, that was it. <laughs> that was it. I'll say it right this time.